The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen only mode. I press start broadcast. Okay. Welcome and thank you all for joining this afternoon. I'm Doreen Anderson and I'm Senior Knowledge Exchange Manager for Dairy in Scotland. I'm joined this afternoon with our new Strategic Dairy Farmers, Wallace and James Henry from Millen's Farm near Galston in Ayrshire, as well as Nick Parsons, AHGB's Dairy Head of Dairy Development, and also with us today is Scott Shearlaw, who is a member of the AHGB Dairy Board and a progressive dairy farmer based in South Ayrshire. I'd like to start with a couple of housekeeping points. All participants are muted, but you can ask questions using the chat function at the side of the screen as we go along, and I'd encourage you to do so. If we don't have time to answer all the questions during this session, we will get back to you later. All questions are private and your identity will not be displayed. If you're a Dairy Pro member, please provide your name, farm name, postcode and membership number into the message box to receive your points. If you do not know your membership number, please enter your email address too. Today's webinar is being recorded and you will be able to re-watch this on our website or YouTube should you wish. We are aiming to finish by 1pm. I'd like to hand you over to Nick to give a few words of an introduction. Yes, good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining today's webinar. Um, due to the coronavirus and continued coronavirus restrictions, uh, we're holding this meeting as a webinar rather than uh, a farm meeting uh, and a launch. But uh, thank you to uh, Wallace and, and, and uh, James for uh, coming along and uh, buying into the idea of, uh, uh, of doing a webinar rather than what they would probably feel far more comfortable at at the moment in doing a uh, doing an on-farm meeting. But uh, as we uh, as we move forward and hopefully the uh, restrictions uh, abate, then uh, we hope to get back out onto farm. So through the autumn and winter months, we'll be hosting a number of meetings uh, for the strategic dairy farms as well. Uh, more launches, virtual meetings uh, by webinar and podcasts. Uh, one of the benefit of these is of being available online is open to everyone so you have the opportunity to join in and learn from the farmers and specialists as we go uh, you can also follow us on the hdb dairy facebook page so please sign up to that or by our twitter uh, account so i'll touch on uh, other bits later but uh, at the moment hand back and hope you enjoy the uh, launch today thanks Dory. Thank you, Nick. Um, Wallace and James Henry are the most recent recruits to join the Strategic Dairy Farm Programme. Today, we will have the opportunity to hear from Wallace and James how the business started and the changes that have taken place over the years and what plans they have come for the coming years, as well as an insight into the background and operations within the business. You'll be given an open and honest view of the farm's performance figures compared with the optimal dairy system key performance indicators. Hosts Wallace and James Henry will give you their aims and aspirations for the future ambitions and long-term vision for the business. You'll also get a greater understanding about the areas that the Henrys have identified for improvement over the next few years. Scott is going to give us an insight into some of EHDB's activity within the dairy industry and Nick will give an overview of the Strategic Dairy Farm Project and we'll put Millen's Farm into context as part of this network. So I'm sure you want to hear from, the Wall from Wallace and James now and a bit about the farm, the herd and the people behind the business. Wallace, can I bring you in at this point? Can you please give us some background about the business and the farm? Hi Doreen, um, well we've been farming in this area uh, for about 250 years Henry Bells itself has been going for about 80 odd years, so we've been here a wee while. Um, when James and I came into the business, we were kind of all year round calving herds. We had five, three tie still barns and two cubicle herds, um, and a flying herd as well. So it, 
we came to, you know, this time in town, we discovered we we're not really making enough money at this, so we needed to change things a bit. Uh, and when my uncle retired out of Mallon's farm, it gave us an opportunity really to take a look at the whole business and see where we're going to go with it. Um, so we had a consultant up at that time, and uh, we then split the herd into two, uh, one at the Mallon's and one at the Porach, Mark Porach being the autumn unit and Mallon's the spring. Uh, so Mallon's is around 106 hectares, um, and then in 2014, we developed another uh, 110 hectare platform at Netherlands. Uh, we saw opportunities with the reduction in milk, with milk quota not being an issue. There was a lot of Irish heifers because they still had milk quota at that time, so we pushed on and brought that other 110 hectare platform onto the onto the farm. So the whole farm, including sort of 30, 40 hectares for silage at Mallons, uh, plus young stock, we've seen 345 hectares in total uh, for the Mallons stock. And there's a lot of farms in between, um, and we, um, we we can manage it quite well. It's pretty wet here, but we can grow plenty of grass. And we're, but usually using the grass at the shoulders is always a bit of a challenge. Um, cereals is just a bit of a no-no for us. Really. We do a bit of winter wheat, but not too much. Fab, thank you. And we'll come to the infrastructure in a little bit more detail about the picture down at the bottom of the screen there in a minute. OK, so this is very much a family affair. So James, can you please introduce the individuals in this photograph? Well, Doreen, uh, if we start on the left hand side, we've got young David there, who is Wallace's son. Uh, and then next to him with white shirt, that's Robert. Robert is currently involved with the farm, more in terms of the machinery side of things. Uh, move on, the red haired chap next to him, that's Logan. That's David's twin, again, Wallace's son. And uh, next to him there, You've got just peeking through the middle there, you've got my son, which is Ross, but he's not really at uh, sort of the age where he's getting started interested within the farm at all yet. And then the next him, that's my uncle Robert there, and yeah, on the fullest to the right there, that's my dad. And uh, they are still going about yet, and they're involved in things, daily things, back and forward, and then also often some of the wit and wisdom whenever they deem that they should be handed it out, pretty much. So that's pretty much the introduction to the family team there. Excellent. Thank you very much. It's certainly a lovely photograph um, of the three generations. I think it'd be one that you'd like to have above, or at least mum, for above the mantelpiece. So I know, James, you're much more involved in the everyday hands-on of the running of the business. Um, can you give us a little bit of uh, an insight and an introduction to the team and the roles that they play in the success to your business? Well, we have a good team. I think we're blessed with very good staff at the minute. Uh, if you see the photograph there, there's uh, next to myself, stand between myself and Wallace, there's Maggie. Now, Maggie is pretty much the car reader. She started with us a number of years ago and uh, just as kind of part time to feed calves. But pretty much now we have so many calves because she looks after the spring mob and then once she's done with them, she moves on and looks after the autumn herd calves as well. But I'm sure you all agree, you know, we have a lot of calves and, and Maggie's the essential part of that to try and rear them to, to a good standard. Uh, if we're moving along, next to, next to Wallace there, that's Gemma. Gemma's part of the sort of, she's part time. She is pretty much does just a lot of relief milking for us and, uh, and also relief calf feeding as well. Next to Gemma there, we have Danny. Danny is the herd manager at the Netherlands farm. He, is, he looks after the cows there and manages them. And then on the right there, we have Rab, who is the manager at uh, Mullins Farm. This is the, 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 the core, really, of the staff. We have another chap, Ned Carswell, who is, again, a relief milker, but he didn't really want to be in the photograph, so we had to renege in that. So, I mean, that is pretty much for core staff. But in busy times, we can pull some staff in from the autumn herd as well. So, and also, you know, there's uh, 
as I say, Robert helps out. Wallace and Robert helps out with the, the Milkins now and again. And uh, Alexander, Wallace's other son, he does a bit of relief milking as well. So that's basically our staff. Perfect. Thank you very much. So we'll go on and talk a little bit about the herd then. Um, can you give us a little bit of insight into your herd and the production, etc.? James, I think we're still with you on this one. Still with me again? Oh, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so. Well, we're running about 600 cows and they're predominantly Frisian type animal. You know, as you can imagine, for a grass-based system, you need an animal that's fairly hardy to work about here because, you know, they're doing a lot of walking, their feet and legs need to be good, so we really need to turn towards more of a Frisian cow. I mean, we did have, before we started on the grass-based system, it was, it was a lot more Holstein within the hair. As I'm sure you'll understand, that's, that's not a cow that is pertaining to that type of system. So the 600 cows are milked over the two, the two, the two, two between Mullins and Netherlands. Uh, they're all calved at Mullins. We start calving uh, around about February, mid February, and we calve away there. And after the first 200, 250 cows, they are marched across the road onto the Netherlands farm, and then we commence milking there. The rest of the cattle are then calved there upon Mullins, and then the rest of my milk are calved in milk there. Milk yields are uh, 5,400 litres of. Fat 4.21, protein 3.45, and our milk goes to Bula. Uh, as I say, it's a spring block carbon herd, and uh, after the, we'll start AI on the 10th of May, and that lasts for, uh, 20, for six weeks, and uh, then we move on to an NH pools coming around the sweep up after that for another six weeks. And okay. really a kind of brief overview of, of our system here and between the two herds. Super. And we'll come on to things like fertility and things later on. We've, we've got some um, discussion to come up about that. Um, I'd encourage people, if they've got any questions, to put them into the chat box, please. And we'll try and cover some, ask, ask um, Wallace and James some questions in a little minute. Okay, so going on to the calves and young stock. Um, I can see here that there is a lovely picture here of Maggie with her calves um, and as you said she's a, a valuable member of the staff and, and a lot behind what, what they do here. Can you tell us a little bit about the, the calves and um, how, how these go through the system and, and what you've got in, into your young stock please? Tell me again. Uh, well I have protocols within the system, which I think, well, we'll start with calving time, really. Colostrum, we see, is a big thing. You know, every calf needs colostrum. So as soon as it hits the ground, or as soon as it's humanly possible, every calf gets uh, three and a half litres of colostrum, which is, uh, and that's non-negotiable. The staff are all aware of that, and that has to be done. After that, the calves will come away from the cows probably around about 24 hours after that, and then begin to tens or freeze, and then that's pretty much baggy takes over from there on in. They'll be in these pens for around about seven to 10 days, and then they'll go into larger group pens in various sheds around about. There's a, a big, well, they're made, there's, most of the calves are held on Millens, although we do have another shed in the Netherlands where the calves are put onto and uh, that's them in there. They're fed twice a day on a teat feeder and uh, they're in there pretty much till, till grass time and uh, then they go into out to grass probably around about May time and the big thing this year we've been trying to rear calves to rear the young stall without using a lot of concentrate so we've been starting doing sort of a paddock grazing type system to try and keep fresh grass in front of the calves 
very much is, the, is to try and keep the, because you know, it's a big thing. We're trying to carve it 24 months. So you're constantly trying to chase them on and, and achieve the, the weight gains that gets you there, because it, it is hard. It, it doesn't take a lot just to set it off in terms of, you know, where we go with some crypto, sorry, salmonella last year, and that fairly stunts the weight gains. And after that, calves are constantly struggling to, to get there, to get to the bullet weights. But, and that is one of the things we're wanting to look at in terms of calf health. We have had issues with the calves, and they're generally around about six weeks old, where we've, as I said, we've had salmonella, We've had crypto issues as well, and uh, and that is a thing which we're needing to work on to try and, and get some ideas to try and do away with uh, these sort of health issues. Also, this summer we had the uh, a wee go with some coccidosis, which again was was something that was a bit of a test, but we wanted to sort it out. But you know, these are the things we can just. Uh, you know, you're struggling to get to this, you know, we're looking to be building at 340 kilos. So it's always important that you keep calves moving on and disease issues is, is one of the, the, the things which sets that back. So that's, as I say, and that's probably, that's our young stock, that's the problems we're having with the young stock. Okay, so there's plenty for us to get our teeth into then over the next few years um, all together. Oh, yeah, well, that's, Something we need to get like, yeah. Yeah. We've got a couple of questions then. So this is for both you and Wallace. Um, the first question is, do you have a problem with the cows moving from one parlour to another? It's not a massive issue. No, they can, they just, they can walk. So uh, we just walk them down the Scrabby Minor Road, which goes past my farm. So they walk down there, just into the paddock, and then they start milking. The, the, the both parlours are quite similar in terms of entrances and exits. And the, the pallet nail and the cow flow is pretty good, so once they get in there, they're pretty, pretty easy to leave. Perfect. The yeah. second question the second question is, are you happy with the herd output considering you supply a liquid processor? And if not, what would you change? The challenge with the output really is the seasonality in the spring uh, carbon, because um, if you look at the graph, extra litres may in June are only worth about six pence a litre. So we, there's no point in us pushing for litres at that time of year. Um, so we have, we you know we restrict output uh, at that time. You know, we're not feeding a lot of concentrates through May and June really for, for the stage of lactation. We do try and feed a bit more through August, um, maybe when it's wetter, just to try and you know extend the, the, the curve as best we can. But you just have to manage it, you know. And it, I think feeding more concentrate at that time doesn't really help fertility anyway. So no, we're quite happy. Really. The the output's not the big issue. I think we'll come to that later on with the touch and cow performance. But um, okay. we don't want to start feeding too much. Cool. And then one more question just now. Then the questions are firing, and I can tell you, you're um, you, you're gonna we're gonna really challenge you. What's the mature weight of the milk and herd and your replacement rate? Uh, mm. Replacement rate is pretty high. Um, we still roll cows between the autumn and the spring herd, so we're rolling about 25 or so between each herd, between 20 and 25. Um, uh, replacement rate is probably around about mm, you know, 27, 28%. Um, and uh, what was that question, sorry? Um, you are your milk and herd weight. Oh, the weight is five sixty kilos. Five sixty. Okay, and the last one I'm just going to bring in just now. How do you identify your cow's bulling? Tail, tail pain. Tail pain. Tail pain. Super. Right. We're going to move on to the infrastructure then. So this is um, over to you, Wallace. Here's a great aerial view of the Millen's farm. Can you just talk us a little bit through about the layout of the farm and then um, the tracks, etc.? Yeah. Um, so the, the the kind of shiny roof shed on the left that was a kind of converted the old silage pit into the calf shed where we saw Maggie earlier. That's got about um, I think fourteen pens of twelve in there uh, for calves. 
Um, then the kind of shed in the centre of the, of the picture, really, that was the old cubicle shed. We took a row of cubicles out of there, put a parlour in there, and built the, the new shed to the side of that at the end. And also the silage pit, we originally self-feed self, self -feed the silage for like an 180 cow here that we had in the silage pit, which is the bottom shed on the screen. Um, but now, um, just to get them out of silage, we feed it in a bunker, which we'll see in a minute. You see um, to the sort of right around the picture is the number of tracks. We've added sort of one, two, three, four, five tracks going outwards from the from the farm for cows, really. So that when you're setting up a grazing platform, that's the key, especially where we are. The grazing on the shoulders is a challenge. So we need plenty of tracks and plenty of gateways in the fields and try to push water trough further down the field. So that's uh, so you have moved to the next slide, we'll see maybe the sheds uh, going in. So that's the cubicles. So that, that's the collecting yard that you see in the left of the picture. The cubicles, um, including the old shed, we've got 344 cubicles in total. And the far away side, you see a bunker, so it kind of swings in. It's filled with a load on the shear grab. So we do have a lot of cost feeding out silage. We just feed it with a load on the big shear grab. Um, it's, um, it was built with a, 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 a SRG, I can't remember the name of the grant from the Scottish Government at that time on slurry stores. So we got 50% grant funding on the store and the slats uh, above it. So that really helped. And there's about a million and a half gallons of storage, at least six and a half months storage for, for that farm. Uh, so that's worked quite well for us, really. Um, and it try, we just try to give a, a system that decent crew flow again through the parlour. So um, we've got a shame getting away out of the parlour just to help it, the eye time and just help things. Cool. And talking about parlours, we've got a picture here of Danny Milk and um, you've got two different kinds of parlours. Can you just tell us what the two different parlours are at the two sites, please? Yeah, so the last site we saw is our new Milfoss parlour, 26, uh, 26, 52 swing over. Um, that one there where Danny's in was a second hand uh, dairy master, 24-48. So that's just there with a collecting yard and the milking shed. Um, it's not maybe so nice when you get a wet day this time of year, but when you're dealing with flies everywhere else in the month of August, that parlour's lovely to milk in. So um, it's, uh, it's good cow flow in these big parlours is key. Uh, you know, one man can operate a 24 a side, 26 a side without a problem. Um, not doing a lot of wiping. Um, cows are pretty clean when they come in because, again, the gateways are pretty clean. So um, just occasionally we're going to wipe if things are pretty wet, but it's pretty good really. And shedding gates on the exits of both parlours again for the item. Yeah, for flu. <coughs> Thank you very much. Um, so again, we've got Danny um, here. He's got a photograph of Danny Major on the grass with his plate me meter. Can you tell us a little bit more about your grazing strategy and when you turn it, the cows out, etc.? Uh, we're trying to get cows out um, as early as we can. Um, Mullins doesn't seem to kick off as well. As Netherlands, I think I'm suffering maybe from not really seeing enough when we put melons in at the start. Um, so we try and go through the the day through daytime there, you know, from any time after the 10th of March. Really, it's it's, it's it's a real challenge. Last year was really wet the winter. We really only get started 25th of March in both places. So, but once it went, it really went with a bang. Okay, things dried up. I say we're on the Netherlands uh, with about 280 cows. Um, and the 25th of March, and Mullins cows are out uh, the night for then on as well. So, because it, it, once it goes, it really goes with a bang, you're going to gradually kick off. Um, and it's managing that's the challenge. So, we, we use Agronet software and measure every week. Um, James is measuring the grass at Mullins for Rab, uh, just through calving time, and Danny looks after the grass at Netherlands. And it's about being bold with those grazing decisions you know, on the back of those measurements that you can take out silage. We've always got a pit open summer through the summer, generally when we're filling silage at Porra, uh, with young stock or melons or overlands. So we can take out paddocks as and when we need to, and it's important you make those decisions and get uh, paddocks out. Um, melons are set up roughly with four and a half hectare platform, uh, sorry, paddock sizes. So that's about three 12-hour shifts for, a, for that herd. Netherlands is a bit more 
use temporary fences because we're doing a bit more silage off that platform for James's autumn herb. Um, so Danny manages that with a balance of uh, reels and uh, uh, those things skill. and skill. skill. But he's got the paddock sizes all mapped out, so he kind of where he's got he's, he's really good at mising that grass, especially in the shoulders. We we did really well yeah. building up grass for this back end. Yeah, good. And you do all your own silage as well, so you've got the hand, you've got the handle and control on that as well, haven't you? Yeah, so we have our own forage wagon. Um, James Winston, uh, Robert Ailey, and Paddy. Paddy looks after the machinery and feeding out the young stock through the winter, so they take control of the forage. And the forage wagon is great for us because it just keeps track of people working with tractors and cow people working with cows, which is for health and safety and everything else. What's far better for me? Perfect. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Wallace and James. Uh, before we go into the business performance and look at the key performance indicators on the farm and what the future plans will be, I'd like Wallace and James to take a few minutes to gather their thoughts and bring in Scott Shearlow at this point to give us a little bit of an insight into what is happening at AHDB and particularly what AHDB Dairy in Scotland are up to. Thanks, Doreen, uh, and good afternoon, everyone. I'll just quickly introduce myself. I'm Scott Shearlaw. I'm primarily a, a dairy farmer from South Ayrshire, where I milk 400 cows. I also sit on the board of VHDB Dairy, and that's why I'm here today. Uh, the main role of the board is to hold the dairy division of VHDB to account on behalf of levy payers and to help shape and ultimately approve the strategy and budget for activity within the, the dairy division of AHDB. I won't take up too much time on the webinar, but I think it's important to briefly re raise awareness of the of AHDB's activity within the, the, within the dairy industry. It's obviously been a, a unique year as a result of COVID-19, and I think AHDB has proven itself to be dynamic in its response to the challenges that the, the year has brought. Um, the market intelligence teams uh, have provided invaluable data to the industry as we transitioned into the, the new market that lockdown created. Uh, the fluctuating consumer demand for dairy was, was tracked weekly with, with data from Kantar and shared via the, the various platforms that AHDB has, including in social media. Since March, we've uh, had a Facebook page which has, has really helped broaden our reach to levy payers. The market intelligence team also tracked milk supply against the industry's processing capacity in the spring, which was obviously under pressure. And that proved crucial when analyzing how the changes in retail and food service demand would affect the market. We also part funded the 1.1 million pound Milk Your Moments campaign along with DEFRA, Dairy UK, and the devolved administrations. The campaign ran through lockdown and, and focused on mental health and also the role that, that dairy has in, in bringing people together. The campaign was delivered by HDB's marketing team, and the independent data shows that as a result of that campaign, £6.6 .6 million pounds worth of dairy sales uh, were driven as a direct result of the campaign. It also achieved very good visibility, uh, being seen by 71% of the uh, of the adult shopping population, an average of nine times. More specifically, in Scotland, uh, we've had some significant changes in personnel, which will make a, a massive difference in terms of what we can deliver for levy payers in Scotland. Doreen Anderson has moved from the farm benchmarking team to become senior knowledge exchange manager in Scotland. Doreen's worked for AHDB for a number of years and knows the organisation inside out. She's already made a significant difference uh, since her appointment and her enthusiasm and drive to get things done is, is really refreshing. Uh, I'm also really pleased to announce that Sophie Brewster has joined the team as knowledge exchange manager. Uh, so we previously worked for Dairy Co before leaving to run her own dairy herd initially as a as a contract farmer, and more recently with her husband and father-in-law at their home farm. She's a she's a huge understanding of the the practical challenges and the technical needs of dairy farming, particularly calving heifer rearing. 
and she'll bring a, a wealth of knowledge to the team. So I'm really pleased about that. Um, historically, AHDB have, have probably delivered uh, really below our potential in Scotland, uh, but I'm, I'm really confident with this new team of, of, of Doreen and Sophie and with Paul Flanagan as Scotland director at executive level, I'm certain we can deliver much more value for for uh, for Scottish levy payers. Uh, and lastly, I'd like to thank Wallace and James for becoming strategic farmers. It's a big commitment, and uh, I'm, I'm really interested to find out more about their business. Back over to you, Doreen. Super, thank you very much, Scott. Um, I'd like to introduce you now to Nick Parsons, um, who's head of the Dairy Development, who will give us a bit of an introduction to the new KPI Express tool and talk about the Strategic Dairy Farm Programme before we look at the business performance at Millens using the KPIs. Thanks, Dory, and uh, good job so far. Thanks, Scott, for the uh, update uh, from, from the board as well. So uh, I can uh, confidently announce today that we now have 18, uh, Wallace and James uh, becoming the 18th of the uh, strategic dairy farms that we're developing across the whole of Britain. So uh, it's been a target to uh, push to 25 as a, as a total, but uh, as you can imagine, uh, COVID and, and uh, coronavirus have, have got in the way of, uh, of the development of that. Uh, if you look at the map, you can see we uh, we already had in the central belt uh, Willie Bailey launched, and now having Wallace up in Scotland or Wallace and James up in Scotland is uh, is great to have uh, have some good coverage uh, coverage up there. Uh, so along with these, uh, we have uh, further launches coming uh, in, uh, in in Lancashire and Yorkshire and down into uh, right the way through uh, England uh, and uh, and another one in Wales joining uh, very soon. So it's it's becoming a positive picture and, and obviously the geographic coverage is more important uh, once we get back out onto the farm. But I think what we're trying to do as well is to give that uh, coverage of different systems. And uh, although the map's very small, uh, I'd encourage you to, uh, to the website to uh, have a look at each of the individual farms. Uh, each individual farm has a uh, web page where we uh, identify the strengths, identify the systems that they're working to, and identify what they're trying to concentrate on. And hopefully with, with going to have a look at those, you'll be able to identify a farm that's relevant to you and be able to follow their progress through the three years as a uh, strategic dairy farm. So it's, it's part of the farm excellence platform, which covers other sectors, all the other sectors as well. But uh, we're, we're developing uh, gradually the, uh, the coverage of, uh, of Britain with the uh, dairy farm uh, group. So in, uh, as I say, encourage you to the uh, website to have a look at that and to, uh, to identify the farms and follow. You can also then identify where the events are, uh, obviously online at the moment, but clearly uh, looking to try and take that, uh, take that back to farm at the uh, opportune moment. So I just want to touch briefly on the KPI Express tool. It's something that HDB have been working on for some while. It's based upon the optimal dairy systems. So we are uh, identifying groups of farmers as all year round calving and giving key performance indicators uh, for the performance of an all year round herd against target and also block carving. So spring and autumn block is also defined within the optimal dairy systems uh, that you can find on the website. So that would identify nine KPIs, uh, nine key performance indicators that you can measure yourself against and be able to uh, uh, look against the target versus uh, your own business. Now you can either use the tool uh, which uh, will come down to one KPI, or you can do all nine by putting in more data. But it gives you that opportunity to uh, compare and measure your farm data uh, against industry targets. Now that, uh, that industry, uh, industry target uh, gives you the opportunity to, uh, uh, to measure through uh, your own business. It's, uh, this is an example of uh, the, uh, uh, the slide that you would get 
by, uh, uh, by, by putting in your own data or by alternatively uh, putting in the calculations uh, that you've already worked through your own system. You can then, rather than just measuring against maybe uh, 10 or 15 of your uh, compatriots within a discussion group, this gives you the opportunity to measure against industry uh, and, uh, and targets there. So we would encourage you to uh, try it. Uh, it's, it's new and it's on the website. The front page of the website will give you the opportunity to click in. Uh, registering takes purely one, two minutes to uh, put some very basic data in and then you're off into that KPI tool. And it will give you uh, a measurement against, as I say, one or more of those uh, KPIs as well as in the middle there and that center box is key and important to how we want to try and take this forward is it gives you an opportunity to look at how you may be able to improve so if you are sat in the below average or average figures and you want to look at that specific kpi and look to try and challenge yourself to improve on productivity improve on performance uh, clearly with uh, the uh, leaving the eu in the uh, next few months uh, there's going to be a need to be resilient and on farm and we believe this is uh, uh, an important part to be able to try and uh, uh, compare yourself against the industry now but also find information that you can help yourself to uh, to try and move for, forward and uh, thank you very much for now I'll hand back to Doreen. Thank you very much sorry I'm just checking to see what questions are coming in um, Thank you, Nick. Uh, Wallace and James, can I bring you back into the conversation, please? We got you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hi. <laughs> In order for you to manage your business properly, you need to know your business inside out. And this is something that you work a lot at and having the ability to compare to others with similar systems or challenges within your region is important to you. You've both been a member of a local discussion group for some time now. How has this helped you over the years? Getting together with other farmers has been a big thing for us, just uh, and getting down to brass tacks and comparing costs with the group was a big thing at the start. I think um, you know James was not sure about it. I remember discussing about you know should we get costs out there, but. At the end of the day, it's like a game of golf. You're only playing against yourself. And if you can find bits that you can improve on your farm, whether it be young stock or whatever area is, and looking at a bit more depth on these, of course, uh, uh, producing a litre of milk, it, it, it really helps focus in your mind and, and looking at the areas that, that for real improvement in the business as a whole. Uh, we built a lot of trust with the group, um, and we can pretty much look at it. Now um, I'm looking at the course of that, and it's been a big help. Well, I was the I was the key in that to all. To be honest, Doreen, like because I'm I'm fairly cynical about a lot of these things. Like it's, it's just my way. But to be honest, I mean I have changed my mind on it. I think it has been really helpful, and it is something that everybody should be thinking about. Like if they're not already, and it's just good craft as well, which is which is always good. Although we missed our summer trip last year, which was. <laughs> I'm sure you can make up for it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so Nick gave us a quick introduction to the KPI Express tool. Um, on here you will see that the, this is what we use for the KPIs and the comparisons and the outputs on the block cabins. I think it's certainly the first steps to comparing your performance to others to highlight areas of strengths and potential weaknesses on your farm. We're using these KPIs within the Strategic Dairy Farm Program, and here are the KPIs we have used, um, as I said, for excellent, good, and average performance. There's five technical and four financial KPIs as displayed in the table. We're only going to cover a couple of these today in more detail and talk through with Wallace and James as what they feel is behind the results and what they think that we could do and what the aim is um, to, uh, to achieve this. So the first one we're going to look at here is the milk from forage. Um, your result on here and the KPI result with the calculations, 3,575 litres. Now, what I can see, you're doing well with this. It's, it's a good result. So you're producing 68% of milk from forage. 
you can have the calculation on what's included in here, it's, it's an average feed of the 845 kilograms of concentrate being fed here. Wallace, can you give us a little bit more insight into your feeding regime and how much concentrate was fed and when? Yeah, well, before the cows go out, obviously we're pushing the concentrate into a fresh calf cow in the month of February, uh, through March as well. So that's an expensive time for us, and the quicker, quicker we can get out through the day in March, the better. Um, so once they're onto the grass uh, and we've got reasonable weather for grazing, we'll drop that down to four and then probably down to three uh, throughout May and June, and then dropping that down again to two kilos ahead. Uh, through sort of June, July, August. We tend to maybe push it up and in August. I find August a rubbish month. There's always passing that in in August. So uh, we tend to feel a bit more through there just to push the, you know, keep the lactation curve that wee bit higher. Um, but we tend to vary the country just depending on the weather. It's got to be flexible with it. We've got south feeders in the parlour. You just need to adjust them according to the weather at the start of milking or whatever. So it's, it's uh, quite simple. I like things that you can fix with a bit of string, so they're quite good for me. It doesn't take a lot of tricks. Cool. So earlier this week in our discussions, we spoke about what would good look like for you with this calculation. And we've, we've written up here the target of 4,000 litres. Where do you think you could make the changes on your farm to achieve this? Well, we've kind of been trying, we've tried really hard on the fertility, we're really disappointed with the fertility empty rates in the scanning there. So, um, you know, we're looking at sort of, Danny was 16% last year, and Marlon's I think was 22 or 23%. Um, and it was, it was just a bit of disappointment. We put a lot of effort into it to try uh, and improve the fertility because we feel we need to get down to this 10% empty rate before we can really start and improve the herd. Uh, we're looking for, you know, we started mill recording this year, so we're looking to drop out the, the least efficient cows in our system, and we can't really do that until we really improve the fertility. Um, what's the usage, usage is actually pretty good on the farm. We don't feed too much, um, but again, we can just monitor that a bit more closely um, on both platforms just to make sure we're not feeding too much. Uh, concentrate when they've got good grass in front of them. Grass always does the job like. Um, looking at some of the webinars we've seen in the past, we'll be thinking we could start the silage everywhere a week earlier and just sort of um, push yield um, from forage through the silage. Uh, so the other thing was I've, I've got the lines all up to the six and a half pH this year. So next year I'm looking to start and get some clover into all my swords which hopefully increases in intakes and reduce the amount of nitrogen I'm going to need to use. It's always quite a tentative thing. We probably need to measure our uh, offtakes of silage just a bit tighter just to make sure we're going to grow enough grass. But um, I've got a sneak of suspicion I can get more intakes into dairy cows with a bit of cover on the squad. Excellent. And it's something that we were, we were talking about as well, about your soil structures and things like this. So it, it's all like a it's a jigsaw, isn't it? It's a jigsaw puzzle and, and making sure that they're all fitting together. The next one that we have, we're have, we going to have a little quick look at here is the full economic cost of production. So you're sitting there at 27.4. Um, comparing yourself again, you're, you're doing a great job and you seem you have got your hand your, your, your um, handle on the costs. But where do you think that's behind this? What's your highs and lows and, and having the impact behind this number? Um, well, we, we off winter, you know, the Netherlands herd, so we've got that off wintering cost, you know, <coughs> intrinsically in, in the spring system. So we're off wintering all the heifers and and about 200 of the cows that come off the Netherlands. So you've got that cost tied into your, your, your variable costs. Uh, so it's actually help, helped us keep a tighter rein on our overhead costs uh, on the farm. We're sitting, I think, about 10 and a half pence a litre. Um, with them, which is it's not great, but it could be it could possibly be better. But I think you know, as far north as we are, we have got that cost of making silage and, and feeding that out again, then spreading that slurry. So uh, on the whole, um, I'm quite hand, I'm quite confident we've, we've got a good handle of course overall. Mr. Weird um, has been excellent at keeping it right with his, his spreadsheet and um, and that's what we offer us over the years. So I use that you know monthly now just to make sure we're doing doing the right thing. Uh, but it's been a good grazing year for us, so um, 
the spring calm here does well in a good year. So. Excellent. Um, yeah, Mr Baird won't agree in this top level stuff. He likes to get stuck in and make sure that he tests you in every every little bit of the CFP that you're using. So the last KPI then, and, and before we go on to look into the future and, and what you're going to hopefully do over the next three years with, with the help of AHDB and, and the working together, the cows and, calves, uh, cows and heifers calving within the first six weeks it's shown here at 71%. I know you touched on fertility again, so it's really key to having that tight uh, calving block. What's your thoughts behind this value here? Uh, again, that's part of the fertility disappointment, I think, Doreen. Um, we've just probably the last couple of years started to get the calves. You know, we've started weighing the last two years now, and we're just putting a lot more effort in getting the calves up to weight. And I think getting these calves uh, coming to the bull and then calving down at the right time is one of the first things to get us in there. And then just keeping pushing, you know, after uh, calving checks and, and making sure everything's right and going through the protocols of the fertility, just to keep that right. I did let it slip when the Muller seasonality then came in the first place, but I think it's better to keep the, the efficiencies of the block calving system right and, and not let yourself get sidetracked by seasonality issues. If you keep the, 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 your own your own herd and your own business doing doing right, it should pay at the end of the day. Um, we're doing one or two other things. We brought some extra autumn calves on this year to help balance that extra spring milk that we have. So um, you're better to keep a tight calving system if you're going down the block calving route because everything else flows from that. If you get most of your heifers calving at the start of the block, they're so much easier to keep them on weight. Perfect, thank you. So looking at the future, we have touched on a lot of these um, these titles here as well. Planning ahead is something that you're always doing. I think that you, you guys, you never stop and stand still. So we've discussed some of the key areas you want to focus on as an EHDB strategic farm. Can you tell me a little bit more about what good would look like looking and thinking about some of some of these topics for the two of you? Hey, fertility sub 10% yeah, into the end of fine, yeah. Uh, so that, that, that's that's where most effort's going to go. I think if we're going to everything else is going to flow from that yeah. really. And we just really need to open that because I just think this year we've just put that much work into it and we think we're just maybe starting to run out of ideas with it like so that's the area where we really need to help with. Yeah. Um, so we've also done a bit of individual testing for cow and we're just going to hopefully if we can improve the fertility then we can actually start and knuckle down on the overall herd performance. It's going to be small issues in different areas. The young stock have done really well this year. Um, there is issues with the calf health in terms of cooks, uh, sorry, trips of idiom at the end of the calving block. So, um, if we can get that bit as well, uh, so it would be a big help. We've, we've gone a long, lot of the way in the young stock this year, uh, but it's just getting all these little areas right, which which boils down to, you know, a more efficient uh, herd really, and, and you know, not only doing your course we but. Okay, super. Um, I've got a few more questions coming in, so we'll maybe just move on to the questions, if that's all right. I'll just have a little look and see. Is there anything else that you feel that we haven't covered today, or that you would like to to mention, or do you think we've we've fairly covered the business well, aspects this now? Some health is a big kind of area for me, just to see that improvement. Um, you know, we're, we need to do a lot of aeration now, and um, having got the lines up to where I need them to be. Um, we're really good with P's and K's over the farm, especially uh, phosphate. Um, so it's just really getting, you know, put a wee bit more effort into that and see what's the potential of the farm really in terms of grass growth. Okay, right. So I'll go to the questions. Um, what is your back to like with not much wiping? It's pretty good. It sits around sort of 25 most of the summer. Uh, this time of year when it's wetter, it slips up to 38 maybe. It just depends on the conditions of the time, you know. It's, you know, if it's wet and murky, then it does start to creep up, like, and that's what's about it. And there has to be some degree of wiping, but the majority of the time through the summer, the wiping's not really necessary. Really. Yeah, clean gates is clean gates. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
Thank you. Um, going back to, so what daily weight <coughs> life gains do you achieve with the young calves on a grass only diet? Um, average, I think we were getting sort of 0. 0.7. 0. Yeah, 0. I mean, some of the calves, sort of, you take the bottom sort of 20 out, some of them are doing 0. 0.85 a day on the grass. So it just shows you the potential <laughs> there. It, it, it's about what moving them every other day or moving them every day just depends. Okay, there was another one here about your genetics. Hang on a second till I just scroll through. Um, where are you buying your genetics and is it a New Zealand based Irish or other? Um, good lot of Irish. See, when we've used them the last few seasons, like we work with Genus Bar Forward and some Cogen, but this is that is the three companies we generally go to, like, but. You know, we've, we've just we started down using you know a lot of Irish stuff just to try and get our fertility better. But uh, yeah, I mean, I think you see the results of the this uh, Moor Park uh, black and white herd, and um, it's given us a bit more confidence in using black and white. We have used a wee bit of Jersey, not much, um, and a bit of Norwegian red, but we tend to come back down to black and white. Yeah. Okay. We have got a question in here about the cattle side as well, Wallace. Um, it's the question is, do you think the cattle trading side of the business is a positive or a negative for your herd performance? <laughs> that <from> Jim <laughs> it's, a, <laughs> it's probably a negative in terms of the management of the business. Like it, it, the management, not the business, but the management of the, of the herds. You know, it's, if you've got cattle coming and going in there, it's going to upset things and, and there's you know the potential there that's where maybe some of the downsides coming so it, it might fall down to the protocols around how we manage these cows like think coming and going into the herd um and it, yeah it's a wee bit harder but that's um i'll need to shoot my dad if we're going to stop buying and selling cows so it's like we're not going to do that just yet no the thing is you've got you've got your handle on it you know the pros and cons and it's something that you've been working on and it shows up on your replacement rates and replacement costs and and it's something that you're aware of so i think that's that's a really important it also uh, helps talk sales as well so the yeah of course it has got the advantage is it um i'm just trying to see if there is any more uh, can i encourage if you've got any more questions sure. that you fire them in um Here's a good one, apparently. Let me just see what this one is. Doreen, I've got one here, which uh, yeah. just to try and help you while you're trying to juggle uh, juggle listening as well as. Uh, so have you considered using vasectomized bulls to aid natural fertility? Wallace, James? Sorry, what was that? Sorry, did you hit? No, right, apologies. Have you, have you considered using vasectomized bulls to aid natural fertility? Uh, yeah, we've got 12 in the system uh, in the old stock shed right now, guys. So we've not used them before, but you think. This is okay, the first thing. Excellent. Okay, super. Okay, the another one we've got is I noticed, so this must have been back at the picture of the cow cubicle shed. I noticed you have some plastic cubicles. What are the pros and cons of these, and would you use them again? Uh, the, 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 the pros are there's always damage in the cows, I think, when you use them. Uh, downside, um, we don't have a strap in between them. Uh, the cows do go through them, uh, some are smaller cows, but they don't, you know, don't have a problem that they don't get any damage really to be honest. Um, they're more expensive if you're on a single row of cubicles because you have a post pair cubicle. Uh, but on that double row of cubicles, they work pretty well really. Okay. And the cows prefer them. You can see the cows um, and then first. Really. Okay. And another one, going back to the silage in your grass. What was the 2019 kilograms of dry matter per hectare grown on the farm? And how does the 2020 measure up to date? Um, mm. the, so this, this year's really been probably one of the best growing seasons we've had. The, the, the grass didn't they, um, take off the way it's done in the past. You know, I've seen us up to you know, 170, 200 kilos of growth per day in a, in a week, in a strong week, but it didn't really take off, but it's, it's held on all summer. He also likes a good drought, so when everybody else down south is more in a way, we're doing quite nicely up here in June. No, and, drought's not an issue. Drought's never an issue here now. So, um, no, it's been pretty good. I'm quite happy with the grass growth this year. Yeah. 
Excellent. Um, well, I don't think we've got any more. Is there any more? One more question. There's one sitting here. There's one just come in. Um, what? Oh, uh, well, I, I got one from earlier, which I don't think you'd uh, picked up on, guys, which is uh, uh, 340 kilos uh, is quite heavy to start breeding the young stock if they're, if they're grazing genetics. I don't know if you want to comment on that. Is that something uh, that you'd consider? Um, Do you hear me? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's a black and white cow. Mm. I mean, I've not, I've not used a Jersey cow. We're on a Muller contract, um, so to go down, you know, a Jersey cross route didn't really suit us. Uh, we're not going to get paid for all that butter fat. Um, and also my stock sales, I like to work with a, a decent sized black and white cow. So yeah, the cow size is maybe bigger than it, it could be on a spring block calving system. And, and again, maybe the fertility's falling down for that, but we'd rather aim high and get decent heifers coming into the system. Um, you know, we'll, we'll build them down to 320, and sort of, I think we've built as low as 315 probably. Um, so yeah, but the target's still 340. Yep. I think what's key is that you know what the weights are and, and it, it's back to this managing uh, by measuring, isn't it? And, and if you're weighing them and if you know the weights, then you're making that decision on the, on the, on the day or on the knowledge. That you're comfortable well, with. I think yeah. for us in terms of just it gives you the confidence that you're you're on target. If you know what yeah. the target is for that month and you 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 know your calves are you know look at the calves this time like, oh god they're not very big or whatever but actually they're on target mm -hmm. and you don't panic and just chuck tons of feeding into them that you don't need to do. So yeah. you know we don't need to do 0.7 all winter so we just feed the diet that's going to do that. We've got some good silage in there at the Youngstock uh, farm so really quite pleased and uh, yeah it just gives you a bit more confidence and you can yeah. pick up the problems i mean the, the coccidiosis issue that we had um we, we dosed them i think it was because they went into a young grazing field and some of the weeds one they um just died down properly and it maybe just upset their guts that wee bit um so then we had to doze after that um and and, and they did fine there after again because the weather was reasonably good Early part of July. So once they're in that grazing system and they get used to what buying the electric wire, uh, Maggie says she was doubtful about no feeding um, concentrate, but um, when you see the way these wee calves can graze it's grass at the end of the summer, um, it's been pretty good. Really. Yeah. It doesn't distract them from grazing grass. We start feeding concentrate at a gate, we fed it for a snacker last year, but it distracts them from the job of eating grass, really. No, it's it. That's a that's a great lesson to share from today's uh, webinar. Is is just, and we've talked about it before on other webinars about weighing and encouraging people to really know know the weights, know know what they're doing. Thank you. So we'll go for one last question. Um, how does your management of your autumn herd differ from your spring herd, if anything? Oh. How does it differ? Well, you're no feeders in the parlour. Well, no, you're not feeding in the parlour, like, I mean, we are, uh, it's uh, basically a TMR system, which uh, works that way, but, you know, it, it's a different way of working, you know, you're pushing harder for milk. In the back end, and, yeah, it's, you know, it's an auto block system as compared to a spring block system, and there is, there's a, there's but in terms of managing, in terms of fertility, it's not really an awful lot of difference in that way, to be honest. Yeah. I think it's just the feeding is the big difference there. Yeah, the, 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 the TMR system through the winter, just to push yields. We don't reach big peaks with the, with the TMR. We probably peak about 25, 26 from that herd. Um, but you find that the, 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 the lactation curve lengthens out. You know, we're still producing a lot of milk in January. Yeah, and then once they go to grass, the TMR feeder gets switched off completely, so they're just on grass. And it's maybe a bit more of a challenge. We do a backing gate in the parlour there just to keep them coming up through the parlour, but um, on the whole, and all the, 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 same. the cars awesome. are my same. And... The cow size is slightly bigger, they're probably a bigger cow just because they're getting looked after that wee bit better after calving. Um, so um, I would say their cow their weight's about 20 kilos heavier. Okay, Bob, thank you very much. Um, I know that you'll be disappointed, but we're going to have to bring this to a close. Um, 
I would like to thank you for your open and honesty. Um, and I thank you, like to thank Scott and Nick for joining us today and thank everybody for listening. If you're interested in following their story online, please Google EHDB Dairy and Strategic Farms. And you can also look out for updates on social media. We hope you will be able to join us when we're back on farm and do a little bit to help the Hendry brothers achieve their goals over the next three years. Thank you and goodbye. Bye. Bye.